Hello again. All right. Last video we talked about interpretations, which was our tool in FOL for showing that an invalid argument is invalid. Uh, and I said the tool that we have for showing valid arguments are valid is natural deduction. So to, in this video, I'm going to tell you about uh, how we need to expand our um, system of natural deduction that we had in TFL to FOL. So th there's nothing radically new. The process is still the same as before. The um, the techniques and the approach that I talked about in the natural deduction strategy video still applies. Um, I'll, I'll give you a second video after this one to tweak the strategy a little bit and give you some more special cases. But basically all you need uh, if you've mastered natural deduction for TFL is to learn a few new rules. Um, some of these are a little bit um, challenging, a little bit confusing, but you'll get the hang of them pretty quickly. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this video is just go through some of the rules. Now, we've got in um, FOL, we've got three new kinds of logical symbols in the following sense. Um, so we've gone from uh, atomic sentences to predicates and names, but that's not going to by itself introduce anything that that changes how we do natural deduction. But the other kinds of new things we've introduced do have rules of their own. So we have identity, which is a special predicate, and we have the two quantifiers, the existential and the universal. Now each of those things, identity, existential quantifier, universal quantifier, each of those things, just like the connectives in TFL, each of them has an introduction and an elimination rule. So I'm going to focus first on the quantifier rules. Uh, identity we'll see a little of in a minute. Um, now, okay, so we have for the universal quantifier, we have an introduction rule and an elimination rule. Likewise, for the existential quantifier, we have an intro and an elimination rule. Each of these pairs of rules, um, uh, universal, intro, and elim, existential, intro and a limb. Each of them has one that's easy and one that's complicated. Let me give you, let's, let's start with the universal quantifier. I'm going to do the two rules for that one. In that case, universal elimination is easy. Existential introduction is easy. I'll just put this out here for now. And the other rules are hard or at least more complicated. Okay, so let's start with universal elimination. That was our easy rule. Remember, the idea behind an elimination rule is we say, well, an elimination rule takes you from some premise or some earlier line, something you already know that has a universal quantifier and gets you to something that has one less universal quantifier, one fewer universal, whatever. The, the thing that was there before gets eliminated. Here's how I think about elimination rules. This question is, this rule is answering the question, suppose I know something universally quantified. Uh, suppose I know something universally quantified, what can I learn from that? If I already know the universally quantified thing, what follows from that? Um, as I state the rule here, I'm going to use a scripty letter F. I know I had an A there before. I'm not good at this. It's been a while since I've had to do cursive. There's a scripty F. That's what you'll see in the statement of the rule. Scripty letters in FOL are just like scripty letters in um, in TFL. So this looks like a predicate, right? It's a capital letter followed by a variable. That sounds like a predicate. But in this case, this could be a complex sentence. Okay, so something that fits this pattern could be something like this. That's a non-scripty letter, so that's just a predicate saying for all x, gx, there's a one-place predicate. But this could be anything, any uh, complex sentence. It might have more quantifiers. It might have, um, it might have truth functional connectives and so on, just as long as it's only got one free variable. So if we had something like, uh, something like this, this fits that pattern, because if you look at the thing that's in the scope of the universal quantifier, there's only one free variable. I didn't do a video on this, but hopefully you've been reading. There are two variables here, x and y, but the y variable is not free in the expression inside the brackets because there's a quantifier on it. 
That is, there's two gaps here, but here I've said something about how you can fill the gap. Okay, so let's back up. Here's the situation we're in with universal elimination. We're supposing you already know some universally quantified sentence, we're saying everything is an F. What can I learn from that? Well, if everything is an F, then I can put anything I want in that gap and I'll get something true. So here's what the rule lets you do. Take any name you like, and notice this is a name now, not a variable. Any name you like, I can drop the quantifier from the original thing and put the name in that gap and I'll have something true. That's it. If I know everything is an F, then I can say anything I want is an F. Anything at all. This part where I say anything at all, pick any name you like, that's the way that this rule is easier than the other rules. Let me show you what universal introduction looks like. I'll tell you why it's complicated. You, I mean, you can see this on the screen right beside us. Um, universal introduction looks very similar. It looks just like this one backwards, except I'll tell you something about what name you're allowed to use. So universal introduction. So if, exist, if elimination rules answer the question, supposing I already know a universal thing, what can I learn from that? Introduction rules go the other way around. They say, suppose I want to have a conclusion that has a universal quantifier. What do I need to know in order to, to figure that out? Okay, our system of natural deduction is going to say, if you want to get a universally quantified conclusion, you need to show that that thing f is true of a, some name a, but this name, ha this name has to be appropriately chosen. Um, the shorthand for you, the, you'll see in the textbook it gives you the specific rules about how a is allowed to be chosen. I'll give you a simpler way of doing it. If you follow my strategy of plan a, work backwards, plan b, work forwards, if you get stuck, plan c, use indirect proof, then when you're going to use this rule, you're going to be working backwards. So you're going to be going backwards and choosing what name you're going to put here when you put this down as a new goal. As long as you make sure that when you make that step, the name you pick is one you haven't seen before. You haven't, you haven't already written down somewhere in your proof. Then you're okay. So this needs to be new. This doesn't have to be new. This can be reused. That's why this rule is easy and this rule is complicated. Okay, that's what the rule is. Why is that the rule? Well, here's the thought. A universal, a universally quantified sentence, you can think of as, in a way, like a big and sentence. So if my domain has, you know, four objects, uh, one, two, three, four, if I say for all x, fx, Basically what I'm saying is 1 is an F, and 2 is an F, and 3 is an F, and 4 is an F. Now think back to TFL. Think back to AND introduction. AND introduction looked like this. If I want to get A and B, I need to get A, I need to get B. Okay. You might expect, I expect, your universal introduction rule to work kind of like and introduction. So if I want to get this thing, I want to show that 1 is an F and 2 is an F and 3 is an F and 4 is an F. The problem is, if I'm doing natural deduction, I don't necessarily know how many objects are in my domain. Right? It might be 4, it might be 5, it might be 125,242. Or some other number. There are other numbers. So I need a way of compactly talking about all of the different possible cases at once. So here's what I do. Suppose we had some interpretation like this that had a domain of, let's say, four objects. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make up a new name. I'm going to pick a name that I haven't talked about. So I'm going to say, suppose we have some object. Give it a name. Call it, I don't know, Bob. Call it Bob. There's nobody I've been talking about named Bob. If I can show, just by introducing this name, that Bob must have the property F, well, then everybody in the domain must have the property F, because I don't know anything special about Bob. Who's Bob? It could be anyone. It could be anybody in the domain. The idea here is when you pick out a new name where you don't have any special information about that person from any of your premises or your assumptions, that name is effectively arbitrary. That name could stand for anybody. 
Therefore, anything you can show about that name must hold for everyone. That's the idea here. Okay. I'm going to move on. We can talk more about this. I'm going to move on. Let's talk about the existential rules. With existential rules, again, there's an easy rule and there's a complicated rule. And the way that one's easy and the way that one's complicated is the easy one lets you use any name you want. And the complicated one says, pick a new one, because it's going to stand in for everybody. And both of these look the way they look, because just like universal quantifier is like a big and, existential quantifier is like a big or. So here is existential introduction. This is the easy one. So this is a little bit confusing because they're flipped. Remember, universal introduction is complicated. Universal elimination is easy. Existential introduction is easy. Existential elimination is more complicated. It's just how it is. Okay, so I said existential introduction. This is the easy one. So introduction rule, I'm answering the question, suppose I want to get some existentially quantified conclusion. What do I need to already know? Well, if I want to show that something is an F, it's enough for me to know that, say, A is an F. Right? It doesn't matter what A is. <clears throat> no matter what object this is, if I know that it's an F, then I know something's an F. Boom, done. Let's leave it at that. What about the elimination rule? This is the more complex one. So elimination, existential, elimination, I'm saying, suppose I already know some existentially quantified thing is true. What can I derive from that? Okay, I said existential quantifiers are kind of like or sentences. So if I know if we're back to this interpretation where there's four objects in the domain, if I'm saying somebody is an F, that's like saying either one or two or three or four or more of them, uh, one or more of those things is um, is an F. That's exactly how OR worked. So think back to TFL. What did OR elimination look like? OR elimination said, well, if you've got A or B or C or D, then... Let's just stick with the case where we've got two of these, just so I have space. Well, if I want to use OR elimination, I'm going to have two subproofs: one that starts with A, one that starts with B. I didn't plan my space well, and I don't want to erase this drawing. Um, assume A, assume B, sh show that some conclusion C is true either way, and then you know that that's true by OR elimination. We're going to do something similar over here. Pick whatever conclusion you like that you want to get. I'm going to try and look at all of the different cases, right? I'm thinking of this as like a big or. I want to check all the different cases, so like F1, F2, F3, F4, but I'm going to do them in one subproof, because I don't actually know that there are four objects in my domain. Maybe there are five. Maybe there are 32. I don't know. So I give you one subproof that's going to stand in for all the different cases. In this subproof, what I assume is, well, one of those many things that are in this OR, right? F1, F2, F3, F4, something like that. So what I'm going to do is take off the existential quantifier, and in this gap where there's a variable, I'll put a name. But it has to be a new name. And I'm going to say, on that assumption, we get to C. So just like with universal introduction where we used a, we picked out some new name and said since I don't know anything about this person Bob or A um, anything that I derive about that person anything that I know about that person must be true about everybody similarly here if I assume that uh, A has F and that assumption is enough to get me C where I don't know anything about A then this conclusion must follow no matter which person A is and this sentence tells me at least one of them is an F, so that should be enough. That's how this rule works. I'll make another video where I use some examples and illustrate these things. I thought I'd just knock this one out quickly and tell you about what the rules are. So that's introduction and elimination for your quantifiers. What about identity? Well, okay, you've got two rules for identity. They're both pretty easy. One of them is just confusing because it's 
kind of dumb. So here's your identity introduction. Anytime you want, for any name you want, you can write that that name is identical with itself. A is the same thing as A. You're rarely going to use that, but we need to have this rule um, in the language just so that we can make sure that something like this is provable. Okay. Here's the actually useful one. Identity elimination. So again, this is a case where we say, suppose you know some identity sentence is true. What can we learn from that? Okay. This is a, a rule like, say, arrow elimination, where you need more than just the identity sentence. You need something else. Remember, arrow elimination said you need not just A arrow B, you also need to have A in order to get B by arrow elimination, right? That arrow sentence needs a helper. Similarly, the equals sentence, the identity sentence, needs a helper. Now, here's how the rule works. We say, th this sentence tells me A is the same thing as B, so that should mean that anything I know about A must also be true about B. So here's, generally speaking, how it works. Suppose you have some sentence that tells you something about A. Well, I can replace one or more of those occurrences of A with B. For all of these rules, you'll see in the textbook and, like, Right over there in the video, you'll see the more precise definition of each of these things. I've uh, simplified a little bit just to try and keep the notation clear. You'll see lots of dot, dot, dots. Um, you'll want to be careful about some rules. We'll say, um, so suppose you have, you're dealing with a sentence that has multiple occurrences of the names or the variables that we're working with. Right? Maybe there are many X's in there. Some of the rules say you have to replace all of those with the name that you're interested in. Some of them say you can replace some, but not all. Um, Take a look at the, uh, the, the definitions of the rules to get that stuff, but this is the general idea behind each of them. Okay, that's it for this video.